Hello and welcome to the Ratio Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Ray, and as always, we're coming to you from beautiful Athens, Georgia. And welcome, everyone. Welcome, any new listeners, uh, to the kickoff of our ninth season. And uh, yeah, nine years. And I, I couldn't think of a better, cooler guest to have on than Mr. J. Grant Britton. Uh, one of the most amazing photographers who have ever strode the earth and uh, a absolute giant in skateboarding and skateboarding history. I can't understate what he means to the world of skateboarding. Um, growing up in a, in a small southern college town and being a little skate rat that was harassed by the university cops and all that, Grant's photos were such a lifeline out to something cooler and and something just brighter that was happening out on the west coast and in my life i can't understand i i I can't really under thank him enough so uh we'll we'll have that talk coming up and i want to thank jason thrasher an amazing photographer in his own right for setting up this interview and introducing me to grant uh, Grant's got an excellent Jason story coming up in the interview, so I will leave it at that. But yeah, as I mentioned, this is uh, the kickoff to our ninth season, and uh, it's insane the people that we've had on. You know, from this point, we've we've had everybody from Kira to King Diamond, and uh, we we would like to have a very diverse group of uh, guests and artists who appear on the show and it's 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 been really amazing you know to say the least uh who we've been able to speak with and work with i remember playing my mother the first episode of this nine years ago or or um right before she passed and uh she was super proud so i hope she's uh you know somewhere on the other side swirling in the cosmos you know, at least aware of, of some of the dust we're kicking up down here. So uh, rest in peace, Mom, and uh, thanks thanks for turning me on to all the cool records and taking me some, to some cool shows and starting all this madness in my head in some way, shape, or another. But uh, yeah, enough of all that mess. We're going to get to the episode proper, but there's just a few things I want to remind you all of. We got some friends out there that have new records out. The Pylon Reenactment Reenactment Society. Their new record, uh, Magnet Factory, is out. And they're going to be touring all up the East Coast this month later on. So head out to these shows and see one of the most amazing bands you can see in the world. Um, And say hello to Vanessa and Jason and Kay and everybody after the show. You know, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Also want to mention Tears for the Dying's new album, In the Shadow of the Midnight Sun, which is featured on one of our past podcasts. Uh, Adria was a, was a kind guest. Uh, that is out, and they will also be touring. So make sure to go out and see those shows. And uh, you couldn't see two better bands than these. They're not touring together, unfortunately. I'm sure that may happen someday. But, yeah, make sure and check them out on these runs. And uh, as far as the Ratio Podcast, man, we got so much exciting stuff coming up. Uh, We'll be at the Bad Religion Social Distortion Show in Atlanta on April 30th covering that. So if you're out, come up and say hello. And uh, we'll be out uh, in California shortly thereafter. We'll be out at the Cruel World Fest with Duran Duran and all that goodness. So can't wait to see our uh, California friends. Uh, we have some really amazing guests lined up to record out there. So it's it's going to be more of a uh, work trip than any type of vacation. But I'm sure I will, me and Melinda will get in some time for rascalry at some point. But uh, yes, and before we get to the episode, finally, I'd just like to thank our, our, our engineer all these nine years and one hell of a human being, musician, artist, everything, father, just the coolest dude ever, Mr. Brent Duncan. He edits these for us and makes sure they sound good and they're mastered out. So if you ever need help on a project like this or a record, hit up Mr. Brent or hit him up through the Ratio podcast 
and we'll get that information to him. Well, just want to get to our talk tonight, and uh, here we go with Mr. J. Grant Britton. All right, everybody. Today on the podcast, we have an absolute legend, and I don't use that word often. So um, I am so, so honored to have Mr. Grant Britton on the show today. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great, Johnny. Thanks for having me. Right on. Well, well, as you all know, Grant is the photographer guru of skateboarding, one of them, and uh, was just such a, a viewpoint, you know, a view. He, he gave us a, a viewfinder into the cool when we were all coming up with his photos. So we just want to welcome him. And, um, you know, there's so many places we can begin. But first of all, I want to ask you know, this is something that doesn't get discussed much with you. Did you start out surfing or skating when you were younger? Um, I started out skating in, uh, I got a skateboard for Christmas when I was about 10 years old. And that was in, let's see, 1965, like in the first kind of skateboarding boom, you know. The, right. Yeah. Yeah. So when it, when it was, went, go ahead sorry sorry so when it was more of like a novelty thought of it in, in that period rather than yeah 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 you had skateboards and bikes and you know that was just we just you know butt board down hills and race each other you know just straight down hills and i mean we're talking clay wheels and kind of a nondescript skateboard it, it would have been like like a department store skateboard, you know, but it had clay wheels. Um, one of my neighbors had metal wheels. So we were one, one, <laughs> one, uh, stage above metal wheels. So. We oh, wow. Yeah. Kind of lucky. My brother and I were a year apart. One of my brothers and I are a year apart. So we both got skateboards. We always got the same identical gifts. So the first, you know, I think we got BB guns and um, walkie talkies around the same time. And so we were riding around on our skateboards with BB guns and walkie talkies. <laughs> you know, I bet y'all were hell on wheels. That's yeah, nice. I lived out in the countryside, so you kind of did whatever you wanted back in those days. Now, now, where were you? Uh, where were you raised at? Uh, I was raised in Fallbrook, California, which is agricultural community. It was the avocado capital of the world and so a lot of citrus you know groves and i mean we had avocados in our backyard and and surrounded by just brush and and groves pretty much oh that sounds amazing you're about 20 miles inland so i didn't surf yet i didn't start surfing till uh 1970 you know when i was probably like 14 or so well, did the, uh, did the skateboarding inform that? Like, you know, you hear about so many others that uh, of the time. Yeah. Um, well, I went to the the movies one Saturday, and they showed Skater Dater, the movie. Right, right. And it was a short, and that was the first time I ever saw skateboarding other than just my neighborhood, you know, friends, you know, riding around on our funky skateboards and then we saw that and we were like whoa you can actually do tricks you know so then you start you kind of well it looks like they're kind of surfing you know yeah so um and then i started surfing in 1970 i got my first surfboard and then you we just spent all our time trying to get rides to the beach you know we were in high school we didn't have driver's licenses I started surfing the year between eighth and ninth grade. So, you know, you, you didn't have a driver's license and you try to make friends with older guys to see if you could get to the beach. Right. right. And, or we would, you know, a little later on, I started hitchhiking to the beach and it would take you two hours to get to the beach and you get stuck in nowhere. And, you know, yeah. It was, yeah. And then the waves then, are gone by the time you get there or. <laughs> yeah. And then my mom didn't know we were hitchhiking and I got busted a couple of times hitchhiking. <laughs> my mom would, my sister would think on me and then that I was, she saw me hitchhiking and my mom would drive down through town, find me 
she'd go get in the car and then she'd take me home <laughs> and then make me and then make me walk back to town. You know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. My mom was good at that kind of those kind of lessons, you know. <laughs> right, right. It is a different yeah. world than people just yeah. really, you know. Uh, well, I want to kind of, you know, there's so much I want to get to with you, but, you know, August, we're going to fast forward up to August 1978, and that that's mm. when the Del Mar Skate Ranch opens. How right. did your connection, uh, your employment and everything w- with that legendary spot begin? Yeah, well, I'd worked at a surf shop in Del Mar, that little town of Del Mar, and it's right on the beach. And and then, but I lived next door to Wally Inouye, and the pro skater. Yeah. And skater for Caster, and he came over. You know, we started surfing together, and then he came over to my birthday party, and I think I was turning twenty three, twenty four. 23 i think and uh he goes hey i i just designed a park would you i think i can get you a job there would you want to work there and i go yeah yeah that'd be rad you know and we were just we were riding in ditches i did skate parks were around but i didn't have a car so i didn't really go to a lot of skate parks and we just rode ditches and rode in alleyways and pretend like we were surfing and doing you know head head dips under bushes and stuff and uh and we skated a few few backside uh, backyard pools, and so uh, I went in and applied for a job, and I got the job because he he and Ed Economy was the other guy he lived with, and Ed Economy was the manager of the park, so they got me a job there, and I went in on the first day, and I had just gotten back from Mexico surfing. I was like beat red from surfing, and my eyes were bloodshot. And, you know, these are the days when I had long hair and a mustache and, and, uh, the guy who was in charge, charge of the whole place, um, sent me home on the first day. He goes, no, you don't need to work today. He thought I was, he thought I was stoned. So, cause I was so just out of it looking, you know, we had surfed for a few days in Mexico and, you know, Mexico's only an hour away from here. So, um, so I went back on the second day. So my official day of working was the second day they were open in 1978. Uh, that's that's cooler than being there the first day. <laughs> that's so yeah. punk rock getting yeah. sent home on the first day. <laughs> yeah. Now, now were you? Did you get a chance to skate the park there at the beginning? Were you just like everybody else, just kind of blown away by by what was going down? No, I skated. They had banks, and you know, I was really into bank, you know, bank skating and. And, you know, I skated the pools too, but, you know, I was never really that great. And then uh, about, oh, seven months into working there, you know, I had been watching all the the photographers coming in, you know, from Skateboarder Magazine and other magazines. And I go, that's kind of cool. And I was an art major at the time uh, out at the junior college, Palomar College. And uh, uh, my friend... Well, so my roommate had a can a Canon camera, and I go, "Hey, can I borrow your camera?" And I didn't even know how to use it. You know, I didn't even know how to put the film in. <laughs> and my roommate put the a roll of Kodachrome, you know, slide film in it. And I go, "What do you do?" <laughs> he goes, "Well, focus it." And I could, you know, focus it. And then, like, what are all these other dials for? And he goes, "Well, just match the exposure needle," you know. You got to shoot a fast shutter speed, like 500th of a second, and then match the, you know, the F stop. I go, what's an F stop? And, you know, I didn't, I knew, I knew nothing. It was like caveman, you know, with fire, you know? And, uh, so I just kind of matched the uh, needle and then he said, well, and have the sun behind you, you know? And I go, okay. So shot a roll of, Kyle Jensen and uh, he was a local skater at the time, probably one of the better amateur skaters at the park. And then I, uh, I got the film developed. I had to send it in. You know, I had no money back in these days either, you know, just to get a roll of film and then send it in to get developed, you know, right. It's like kind of an expense, a big expense for me. 
And so, you don't know what you're getting. So, like, like now, I mean, we'll get more into this, but it's got to be, you know, incredibly frustrating, I guess. But, you know, you're, you're just kind of, you know, sailing along in this and learning as you go, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so I get that first rollback, and, and uh, there's, like, two, you know, I'm holding the slides up against, you know, up against the sun, you know, looking at them, and I have no magnifier or anything. You know, and I'm just like, wow, they look pretty good. And I got a couple of photos that were, I guess, in focus. And then I got another roll of film and I got another roll of film. And I was just kind of using any a- extra money, you know, that wasn't food money um, or rent money for photography. And then I figured out that black and white was cheaper, but I had no way I'd get it developed and I'd just be looking at these negatives, you know, and yeah, I was giving away photos, you know, I was giving away slides to people. Hey, you want a slide? You know, <laughs> so I'm getting stuff back from people go, Hey, you gave me this, these slides back in the early eighties. Do you want them back? And I go, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll scan them. So yeah, apparently I was just giving stuff away, you know, for, cause I didn't have anything to do with them. And then, uh, so in, about 81 so i was shooting for about a year and a half and then 81 um sonny miller who was a local skater and a photographer became a cinematographer he's passed away in the last you know probably eight years ago or so but uh he was he asked if i wanted to go into the dark room at palomar college and and print one of my photos so i you know showed up the next day printed something when it came up in the developer i just went Oh my God, this is, I mean, it was one of those light bulb moments, you know, when you figure out that, you know, cause it was art, but it was like immediate and it was just cool. You know, it was like alchemy and, you know, science and everything just mixed all together. And then the next day I changed was right at the beginning of the semester. I had three art classes and I dropped all my art classes and and enrolled in three photography classes. That's fantastic. And then it, yeah, and then it just, you know, just grew from there. And I was still working at the park and yeah. But I was at I was at Palomar I was in the dark room from the time they'd open in the morning till I had to go to work at the skate park in the afternoon. So now and now, I start and I started hanging out with other kinds of photographers too at the school you know there were all these little groups there were you know the surf photographer group surfers and skate photographers and there were the boudoir and fashion photographers and landscape photographers and but i got to know all these different people and i just took every photo class i could take because i wanted to get you know good at doing everything was this more for you to now? Were you planning to go further into photography, or were th- was this just to document what was going on at Del Mar? No, because I wasn't really. You didn't think of it as documentation then. You were just shooting your friends, and I was working at the park, so I was there all the time. Some pro would come in, and I, whoever I was working with, I, eventually I became the manager of the, the pro shop, and so I kind of ran the place. And then I'd go, hey, uh, so and so's here. I'm gonna go. Out. I'm gonna sneak out and shoot some photos. So, you know, I'd be at work, but I'd be out there shooting photos too. And then we had a, we had a wall, a wall in the uh, like a wooden, you know, shitty little wall in the, by the snack bar, and we'd put up our skate photos. And you know, we didn't really have, I didn't have a magazine. You know, I'd sent stuff to Action Now magazine and got it rejected. And and you just that just makes you you get better, you know, Yeah. yeah. rejection, rejection helps a lot. You know, you just can't be a crybaby about it and, and give up. You just keep doing it. And well, I'll do better. And, and I was l- just learning by looking at the magazines and figuring out what, what was going on. You know? Yeah. And so skateboarders really the only magazine that that's got any coverage of it at the time. Yeah, skateboarder, and then it turned into action now, and it got all watered down. You know, I mean, they had a cover of a someone on horseback jumping over a rock, you know, on the yeah. cover. Yeah, and it just got, and they started trying to, you know, it was actually a predecessor to what happened 20 years later with, like, uh, 
stance magazine that trans world put out where it was it was action it was music it was fashion it was you know it was art you know so they were kind of ahead of their times but it was so weak that you know and it made all the skaters mad you know right. that they would bail on skateboarding <laughs> so then thrasher they they went out and skateboarder or action now went under in like i don't know 80 and all the photographers that had been shooting skating left and went into m you know motocross and bmx and surfing and and they kind of just left skateboarding because there's no way to make any money at it because you know, skateboarding had died by then and uh so then thrasher started up in 81 i started sending them photos and they printed a few when they needed somebody you know a skater from you know down in san diego they would you know ask for photos but i probably had maybe six six photos in thrasher over a couple of years and and then in 83 um when i was still working at the park larry balma who owned tracker tracks came in one day and he knew me and that he had seen some of my photos and he wanted to know if I wanted to work on a newsletter they were doing. And then a couple months later, he called me and wanted me to check out the newsletter. So I went up to Oceanside, saw this magazine laid out on the wall. You know, this is before computers and everything. So everything was done by hand. And I realized they were working on a magazine. And then I just started working on the magazine and I started doing all the dark room work you know, out at the college, you know, I'm printing the pictures for the magazine and, um, yeah. And then I was the photo editor for 20 years and that's my story. <laughs> Good, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, I was going to get to Larry, uh, Larry Balma and, and tracker, you know, getting this, this together and, and, you know, looking before we get off Del Mar, what was, I, I always loved your pictures that were taken at night there. You know, and yeah. how late did that place stay open? Well, they stayed open till 11 o'clock every night. Even when skateboarding was dead, they were open till 11. That's there'd amazing. be two people. There'd be two people skating unless it was raining or got so foggy that the cement got slick because because you're near the beach. And uh, yeah, they'd keep it open till 11, seven days a week. And and yeah. you got and you got so many of those wonderful golden hour sunset mm -hmm. kind of photos and it really painted a picture to us back on the east coast and that's kind of like what, what did larry balma did he see those photos and was like hey i need to get involved with this guy um i think he was just hard up to find <laughs> <laughs> anybody like down in san diego that would you know work i mean it it was a lot of us were just okay the first staff we had it was you know, Neil Blender and, and Lance Mountain, you know, they shot photos and, and Marty Jimenez and Britt Parrott and uh, GSD and, and everybody did art or photos or wrote. And some people did, you know, all of them. So he was just trying to get a crew together to work on the magazine. Nobody knew how to make magazines. We had a guy doing the scans, the half tones and all that. And, it was really like just, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. You know, you didn't you didn't know how to do anything. And we just kind of learned along the way. Yeah. So, And I mean, you know, learning. Did you have any did you take any business classes? Oh, uh, hell no. No, I, <laughs> I, I worked in a surf shop and I worked in the skate shop and then I worked in restaurants. You worked in restaurants back then. So you would at least get one good meal a day you know? Right. So well, yeah, I just did, you know, odd jobs and I, well, I did art jobs. I, I did cartooning and did business cards and things like that, but you couldn't, nobody would pay you. And, oh, it was just, you know, I was living off. There was a time when I didn't have work and I was living off my, uh, my grandmother when I'd get really bad, I'd call her and go, I don't have any food. <laughs> and then, and then she'd come up and take me shopping, you know, for, some you know i only did that a few times but um yeah i was eating oranges off the tree next door and campbell soup you know so right. 
And, and you know, I, I guess that's, you know, one thing one thing that I want to get into that. What was the what was the relationship like between Trans World and Thrasher? Well, <laughs> or the they have been going they have been going for two years before we started. And there was all all already a rivalry, you know, between Indy and Tracker. Indy was op- uh, owned by Fausto and he owned Thrasher. So, and then Larry started up a magazine and it was kind of uh, as a response to some things. They wanted something a little more parent friendly, Transworld did. And so, well, it was Peggy and Larry. They were just bummed on, you know, it was probably the boobs with the indie stickers on them and the partying and stuff like that. So they wanted to come out with a magazine that was more clean cut. Me, I didn't care, you know, but trans world, when they started, you know, at first it was so bad, you know, the goody goody thing. I was like, Oh, I don't want to work on this, but then it's the only game in town. You know, Thrasher wasn't using my stuff. I mean, I'm on the ground floor of something. So, you know, it was like, what else are you going to do? You're down in San Diego and there's San Francisco and LA and in San Diego are the hotbeds of skating, you know, on the West coast. And, you know, just that I was able to get God, my name on a photo, you know? Oh yeah. That was like, that was like a big thing back then. <clears throat> Excuse me. You get a, you get a photo in a magazine or whatever, and then you wouldn't get any photo credit and you're like, and you wouldn't get paid. So, you know, this was like, you'd see your name and you know, you're in the mass quiet. That's my dog. Getting back to to kind of you know the dynamic between Thrasher and Trans World, was there was there much competition with other photographers of the time? Um, <clears throat> well, I would I would go up. See, what was funny was they had to deal with me because I also ran the skate park. So, you know, people would come from you know NorCal, and you know I was known as Oh, that's Grant that works at the skate park, you know, and then I got I started shooting photos and that just opened up a whole new thing for me where I wasn't just Grant that worked at the skate park and would kick people out and stuff or 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 clean up barf or whatever Um, or or call the ambulance when somebody fell. Um, Yeah, it was uh, I'd go to Northern California and I'd get that. Oh they're from this they'd always refer to us as the slick glossy magazine (laughs) like it was a bad thing you know and as a photographer i was just like wow hers looks it looks pretty good (laughs) you know it looks better on slick got glossy paper so but i became friend you know i already knew a lot of people up there so i you know i knew mofo and from thrasher and bryce knights and they actually became friends of mine you know for a while it was a little competitive uh i got kicked out of thrasher once by fausto i was just visiting and fausto walked in so what's he doing here and they go well you better leave and then i shot a ramp uh, a ramp that belonged to uh bryce up there and i think thrasher had paid for it or whatever and i shot photos and then i got a call later that from one of those guys saying hey uh you can't use those photos <laughs> You know, because, uh, you know, Thrasher didn't want you to use them. So, yeah, there was a rivalry. And, and uh, yeah, we were total competitors. Right. And then then we got really big, too. You know, for a while it was we were just this tiny thing. And then and then after a while we were, you know, financially we were rivals, too. So. Yeah. Well, there was so but much I got, content. I got to be I've got to be more and more friends, you know, with the other guys, too, you know. Your rivals, but you're, you know, Mofo and I actually started working together at contests. He'd go because there were other photographers coming in from the outside and they're up on the decks of the ramp. And then he's he's like, hey, let's not shoot on the same side of the ramp anymore. We'll switch off halfway through the contest. So we kind of started working together like that (laughs) because we didn't want to be shooting the same shots, you know? Yeah being on the same side of the ramp. So no, and now we're really good friends. Yeah. 
Well, well, shooting ramps and pools. Have you ever been injured shooting skaters? Yeah, yeah. You get hit. I mean, that's just part of it. You know, you're right there. Yeah, you get hit in the head or the face now and then, or you'll, you know, you. I think one of my, what my right on wait my cameras my left arm is my blocking arm, <laughs> where I'm blocking boards with my left arm, and you know because I'm right-handed shooting. And yeah, so you get, you know, you get hit, you know, you get a shinner now and then, but it's not as bad as what the skater's getting, you know? Right. You know, oh, yeah. I, I'm going to be able to walk, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had I had the easy job. Well, what was it like when you, when, when, you know, there's this huge shift towards um, street skating? Did that kind of, did that affect your technique in any way or, or how you approached it? Well, I just took what I knew from, vert, you know, because I learned on vert skating, you know, that's how I learned photography because that's what everybody did. And then when street skating, you know, they started bulldozing all the parks. And so people built, you know, skaters, you know, they're not going to give up skating because somebody's not building parks, you know, they go back to, you know, building ramps in the backyard and going out in the streets and, you know, doing slappies and, on curbs and mm-hmm. and you know maybe jumping off a few things but i just treated it like it was vert skating and i just adapted it to street skating you know the angles are pretty much the same you know um it started to change big time when you know you know people like Nadas and gans are skating uh rails you know oh yeah but you just figured out the angles you know you shoot you know, you're at the bottom of the stairs or the top of the stairs or with a fisheye or you're with a long lens and you get the whole rail in. And I really got into, you know, you got to show the takeoff, the actual, you know, action and then the landing to show the whole story. Um, a lot of kids, when they start out, they'll crop so much. You're, yeah, it's a guy on the rail, but you can't see how long the rail is. You can't see how tall the rail is. You know, you, you got to tell the whole story, you know, in one photo. Oh, yeah. So, and I remember you shooting sequences. Cause yeah. We were, we were using those to try and learn the tricks. How hard yeah. is that to get right? Well, the the big thing is the expense, you know, of just shooting. You know, I had a 20-roll rule usually. But you'd be trying to shoot, especially in the 90s when it was all technical. You know, skating got, you know, flipped flip in flip out you know tricks and and it the tricks were so difficult people would bail them so much but can you hear my dog chewing no 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 it's fine okay good he's chewing on this plastic toy (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so yeah it was just so wasteful you know a film and the expenses you know the magazine was paying for it and we would send film to other photographers you know around the world and you know, people would try to get one trick and, and waste 10 rolls of film, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, so the... I, it wasn't a creative thing. It, that was the documentation, you know, because you wanted to document that, yeah, the person made it. He's not just going up and bailing, and you had to show documentation of it. But it wasn't creative at all. I I prefer to take those sunset photos like at Del Mar. Yeah, or yeah. even or even now what I do now, you know. Well, so moving to digital, were you? Were you, I guess I'm assuming you were in favor of that. Yeah, because I was a photo editor and I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like like a sequence. Well, at first we were shooting. We had moved into shooting medium format for stills. We were everybody was shooting Hasselblads. So we all had to get Hasselblads because Atiba Jefferson started shooting Hasselblad and then everybody else, you know, oh, I got to get a Hasselblad. And then just the fisheye for that is four to six grand, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we were shooting for stills. We would use the Hasselblad. Almost everybody quit using 35 millimeter during that time, except for digital sequences. And, you know, the. I think the cameras were only four megapixels or whatever, <laughs> but, 
but sequences are only, you know, they're so tiny anyway, you know, so they worked and that just, that just made it so much easier and so much cheaper. Um, I mean, it was amazing. And I was one, I think I was the second skate photographer to get into digital. There was a Brazilian guy, Daniel Borky, that was shooting digital and it's okay. Don't do that. <laughs> He's doing that rubbing his butt on the carpet thing. Well, that's perfect. I've got that. See, that's on my podcast. That's, that's amazing. Oh, quiet. Hey, there, quiet. there's there's our new star. Yeah. Here, chew on that. What's his name? Yeah. Uh, Arlo. Arlo, welcome to the Ratio Podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, his name's Arlo Ruffrey. Uh, that's amazing. See, everybody just, um, that just heard that is having a much better day now. All right, good. That name. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of him. I'm trying to get him interested in something else right now. You know, to, I'll let him outside. Because he can bake in the sun, and then he's totally happy. Oh, yeah, that's that's like ours. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, he's there. Cool. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, digital and the sequences. So, yeah, it was... I got into it right away, you know, and I wasn't worried, you know, people were like, well, it doesn't look like film. And then they would tweak it in Photoshop. And then it, I go, well, it definitely doesn't look like film now, you know, <laughs> you know, cause they were like desaturating stuff and right. Yeah. And, and it was just too much. It was overkill, but yeah, I just use it. It's a tool, you know, it doesn't. Yeah. And nowadays, I mean, besides the, you know, you're, the people that are totally into the um you know like analog and stuff you know for magazines you know i'd get into arguments with kids you know photographers that are in their 20s and i'm trying to talk them in using digital i'm the <laughs> oldest skateboard <laughs> photographer and i'm trying to talk them into it and they're i go you know what it's all digital in the end you know by the time it's in the magazine it's digital right you know so, yeah, I just and then essentially everybody was shooting their sequences on digital and and uh, lots of times it would just be raw digital right out of the camera and then we would have to fix them up. And but I shot I shot full pagers and center spreads on digital even back then, you know. Right, right. Well, and then when we left when we left Trans World, we started the skateboard mag. And we changed the size of the magazine, the format of the magazine, so that Hasselblad would fit better because we were all using, for stills, we were using the square format, right. you know? So we made the magazine wider so it would fit better. And, uh, yeah, and then digital got better and better and better, and then everybody just went over to digital. And that was, you know, now you do film to be different. And it's it's you know pretty much the same result in some some cases, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing with the thing with film, it's the importance it has. I mean, it looks great, but the importance it has, it's more of a craft now. You know, where somebody took the time to shoot film and then make a print, and you know, there's just all that. Well, um. Uh... So, so, you know, Del Mar, let's get back to it. Everything comes back to Del Mar. <laughs> Del Mar closes down. What was, what was that like for you when, when, when all these, the, the parks started, uh, going, a place you've invested so much time and, you know, your creative energy? Yeah. Well, I quit working at Del Mar in 84. They closed down in 87, but I was still there all the time. You know, that was our home park and, you know, my assistant manager, Chip Morton, took over as the manager. And then there were a few other managers. And then they hired a non-skate manager. And, um, yeah, and it got really bad then because the guy didn't understand, you know, what was going on. And uh, so they closed. They wanted to build a Hilton, I think, there on that property next to it. Because that property was a big sport. There was a tennis club and a driving range and a miniature golf course and there was a trailer park. So where the trailer park was, they 
bulldozed that and put in a Hilton and they didn't want to do deal with escape borders anymore. So they just closed it down. They, they uh, jackhammered it. And it was, I, I think I was on a trip and I, uh, Todd Swank, my assistant called me and he goes, Oh, they just, they bulldozed Del Mar. And I'm like, Oh no, you know, it kept closing down and then reopening. And then finally it closed and they jackhammered it. And, so I got off the plane and I went straight to Del Mar and just saw it totally. It's just a rubble of, you know, a rubble cement field. So, and, but everybody just started building stuff. There were, you know, and then Tony Hawk moved out to Fallbrook and built his ramp. And there was another Fallbrook ramp. People were going inland because they could get land cheaper. Right. And, uh, and you know, away from the coast and, and, uh, yeah, it's just as skaters just may do, you know, you're not going to get rid of skateboarding just because you bulldoze everything. Right. So, right. And then Upland got bulldozed. Del Mar got bulldozed and then Upland got bulldozed after that. So, oh, God. and those were the last skate parks in Southern California. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The end of but we end. just, we just may do there's, then street skating came up and I was going to LA all the time and shooting in San Diego. And I was going up and, you know, hanging with Gons and Nottis and then going up to San Francisco and shooting with Tommy Guerrero and, and, you know, and then, you know, I was traveling too. So right. probably once a month I was going to a contest, you know, flying somewhere and then going overseas, started to go overseas in 85. I went to, um, Europe for the first time for a month and a half went by myself and just met up with people over there and just took trains everywhere and stayed at people's houses and, and, you know, get a car ride to Germany from Amsterdam and take a train to Sweden and, you know, went to the Swedish summer camp and the French summer camp and made a lot of friends. People had stayed at my house in, when I lived in, you know, Cardiff, Lucadia, Encinitas, and then you hit them up and you stay at their house in Europe. So oh man, it was really cool. We were all a big family, you know? Yeah. It sounds amazing. And then they wanted, they wanted to get their picture in the magazine. So even if, <laughs> even if they hated me, they still wanted a photo in the magazine. Well, you know, it, it, it's it sounds like you you've been able to live this amazing life and and travel and that's got to be you know when you look at something like skateboarding giving you that you know it's it's such for all you've given to the sport um to toot your horn sir um <laughs> it it's it's amazing to see stuff like that come back and have those experiences but yeah when we but, met yeah, go ahead you know i always say this but I was in the right place at the right time. You know, yeah. if it hadn't been for, you know, living next door to Wally in a way or me surfing and getting out of high school and then moving to the beach and then living next to this pro skater. And then he just happened to be, you know, designing Del Mar skate ranch. And then my roommate having a camera, you know, it's just, you know, it's all those accidents in life, you know, that everybody, has you know and and you're just in the right place at the right time you know you have no you have no talent in the beginning and then you just work hard at something and then you get better and better and better you don't give up when somebody tells you you suck and you just you know you just stick with it you know and and sometimes things happen you know absolutely yeah well uh, the, the uh, real, uh, you know, I, I hope this is the first of many. Um, your book, Push, which has been released, it's uh, 80s skateboarding photography. And let me just tell you, it is a, a sight to behold. So can you tell me how this all came together? Well, thanks. Um, well, originally, no, I, you know, every photographer wants to do a book. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just something a photographer you know, every photographer I know, even non-skate people, they go, oh, I want to do a book. They're always working on a book and a book might take years. You know, you got a box of photos or you got a garage full of photos. And that's what I have. And uh, so I finally um, uh, a guy I knew approached me 
and one and he had done a few other books i probably won't mention any names um and he wanted to do a book so we worked on a book for two years and then after two years he kind of bailed on it and uh but i pretty much had a book done and i'd been working with my friend josh higgins who's a designer um i mean he worked on you know he worked on the obama both obama campaigns and worked at facebook and i mean he you know we talked he did a show of mine in san diego in 2003 and we had talked about doing a book in 2003 i go yeah and he really wanted to do it and so i just held other designers wanted to do a book with me and i just said well i've already promised it to josh higgins and uh he was in the band fluff yeah yeah he was the bass player in fluff with o yeah uh, yeah yeah and uh so i i kept it for him till you know what is it 2019 when we started working on this and so he came up with a kind of a designed a basic layout what we wanted and so we were almost ready to finish the layout and go to print and it was going to be um the person who was doing it uh was it, he was going to self-fund it because he had already done some other books and then he bailed like during covid i think he got cold feet during covid and like a lot of people just you know your lives everybody's lives are you know upended and so he bailed on it and then the next week i I wrote an email to somebody I knew at Ginkgo Press and he had left Ginkgo Press. And then I, I actually uh, emailed him to see if there was somebody that I could, you know, contact there. And he goes, Hey, you're in luck. I just came back to Ginkgo. He had been working on some other projects. And so I sent him the mock-ups of the uh, book and he took it to a meeting the next week and they go, yeah, we'll pu publish your book. And so then they hired somebody to a designer to go in and do all the final designs and pull in all the captions and things like that, really get it ready for press. And so it got printed at the very end of 2020 and, and released in the beginning of 2021. And they did, they did 4,000 copies. They've sold through those and they're on their second printing and uh, of another 4,000 they've got a few hundred left. So now we're talking about a third printing. Well, so, I, I, but I, we had originally, sorry, originally we had been talking about, you know, when I was with the previous person who was going to, you know, print the mag uh, book, um, we were going to do a 40 year kind of retrospect. And then once we got into it, we go, there's too many photos. And I had some, I had some weak areas where, you know, when once I had kids, I quit traveling as much and I kind of just shot around San Diego and shot a lot of locals and shot a few events. But it wasn't, you know, there were a couple of periods in, you know, those 40 years that uh, it was a little redundant, you know, so um, we just decided to do the 80s because there were so many 80s photos, you know. Oh, yeah. And to... And to me, that's like the golden age of skate photography, you know, and skateboarding. It really is. And and, and yeah. how does it feel to flip? How does it feel emotionally to go down this journey when if you, when, if you flip to pick up this book and flip through it for you? Um, well, I use it to look up years. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody asks me, hey, when was that photo taken? And then I look in the book if it's in there and I go, oh, yeah, it's 88 or 87. Cause it was kind of like just a blur to me, you know, like I'll look at the dates. Well, what's great with having all these analog photos too, is that I have this slide is imprinted with the date or the negatives. I wrote the, the year on it, you know, so, and the months sometimes. So I'm able to look back at all that stuff and, and for future, you know, you know, projects and things like that. So no, it's, it's, it it really those were like the best of times for me. I mean, when we're talking around eighty three, 
I moved into the skate park and lived on the pool table for eight months, you know, to save money. I broke up with my girlfriend at the time. I moved all my stuff into the back room where all the Cokes and everything were, were stored. And there was a shower there, you know, over at the trailer park. And I'd go to Denny's to eat or the coffee place down the street to eat, you know, and I just, I lived on this pool table for eight months, slept there every night and did night security at the skate park because people would break in and try to steal everything up out of the pro, pro shop. shop. Oh my God. So we always had, so for years we had somebody, usually a skater would be staying there, you know, at night, you know, when we close at 11 and then he'd get up and when we, we'd open it like nine or 10 in the morning and then the guy would, move all his stuff and put the cue sticks back and but yeah it was like i was living the life you know and then uh, during the day i was going to the to the college and working or later on to trans world and working and sleeping on this pool table yeah well you know? now did you did y'all get hassled by the cops out there a lot was there you know, it's younger kids, so it's was there a lot was there any drinking, you know, pot smoking and stuff like that that was like drawing attention, or is it just skating and stuff? Where at the skate park? At the skate park. Um, yeah, the parking lot things would happen. I was like, you know, people would bring their kids there and drop them off at nine in the morning and pick them up at six at night, you know. So I always tried to keep it kind of clean. I tried to keep it as a safe space. Yeah, you know, yeah. for for kids to come to, I mean, I'd work on, I'd work on Christmas day or Thanksgiving day. Cause I, I made up the schedule and I felt bad if I scheduled somebody to work on a holiday. So I would just work. And then, uh, moms would bring me like Thanksgiving dinner and stuff at the skate park. And, <laughs> and, you know, if a kid didn't have money to skate, I would give him a trash bag, go pick up trash and get a free skate session. So, yeah. Um, people could trade gear, you know, like the pros to, to make it okay with my boss, the pros would bring a board a month in a deck that they were getting for free. And that would give them a month worth, worth of skating, you know, but it was, you know, we're talking $3 to skate for two hours or $5 all day, you know, so it wasn't expensive to skate and, uh, yeah, but I tried to make it a kid friendly place and family friendly place. And and they kept the party into, you know, outside or everybody would meet up at the skate park. It was like the clubhouse, you know, they'd meet up and then they'd go to a show or go to the movies or, you know, go, you know, skate somewhere else. So it was skate parks were a lot different back then than probably they are now, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the world's so different now, you know. Yeah. Um, well, they I, were the they were the the mecca. You know, Del Mar was a mecca. You know, for skateboarding. You know, oh, it was absolutely. a gathering place. Everybody would travel from, you know, the East Coast or Europe or or Japan or Australia, and they would, you know, there were people sleeping in the parking lot back then. Skaters would buy some old shitty car and and live in it. My friend Dave from Dave Mock from Australia lived in his Plymouth Duster out in the parking lot. Damn. You know, for like a, probably like six months, you know. <laughs> yeah. But they were in heaven. You know, they're you got an eighteen year old guy and he's just his first big trip and he's sleeping at Del Mar in the parking lot. He's, he's stoked. Skating you know? the keyhole the next day, yeah. you know. I mean, God almighty, and that you, sounds amazing. Yeah. You become a local, you know. Right away you're a local. Yeah, yeah. I I get chills when I think of how important the scene was, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of artistic ideas. I mean, it I'm it, it really just I don't know, fills my spirit when I think back mm -hmm. on it. And we were talking when you were here in Athens, you know, a little bit back. Why do you feel what I mean, there's there's obvious reasons, but why do you feel so many people that came out of that scene went in and led artistic lives, got involved in the arts, and seemed to look 20 years younger than people their same mm -hmm. age. Do you, do you think it's just staying close to, to something that meant so so much to you in your youth, or or you just think it's a lifelong journey? Well, you know, skating, it's 
it is an art form, you know, it's, it's not only a sport or a lifestyle or whatever, it's an art form. And I think that people that skate are creative, you know, they've got that creative, you know, spark in them. And so you had a lot of these skaters and maybe because of skateboarding, they got into art or vice versa. You know, they're, they just have these art brains where, you know, skating is just so you can do it by yourself. You don't need a team. You don't need, I mean, now you don't even need a skate park. You can just ride out your front door, you know, and it's just this creative thing. You spend hours by yourself sometimes and you're just, I mean, think of somebody like Rodney Mullen, who, you know, his yeah. parents didn't really want him to skate. And he lives like, you know, he skated in a garage, you know, space for years, you know, and invented all these crazy tricks. He was by himself a lot. Right. You know, didn't he skate and, in the middle uh, of the night, too? Yeah, I think yeah. so. He still does. He still still does. I've I've met up with him at um, at Dwindle Distribution and I shot photos of him a couple of times at nighttime at the factory when nobody's there. And he's just got skating down the aisles and, you know, and he's all by himself skating, <laughs> you know, or he would be on a tour and, you know, Tony and Stacy and people like that are saying, yeah, um, he would just disappear and he'd go out and skate at two in the morning. Uh, he'd find some covered garage if the weather was bad and, you know, a, a car park or whatever and skate, you know, but I think it's that whole creative mind thing. And, you know, the way, the reason I got into skating and, and surfing was I could do it by myself. I wasn't a big guy. You know, I couldn't play on a team. I was crappy at every sport pretty much. And I was good. I was good at surfing and I was good at, you know, okay at skating and you don't even have to be okay at skating to have a great time absolutely but, but you, just the whole creative thing you know there's so many artists and musicians and guys in fashion and and people follow skateboarding you know yeah because it's it's cool it's cool as shit you know it's such a it's such a crossroads of so many things you know yeah. coming together at once Mm -hmm. and, and then I, jocks jocks beat up on us you know oh yeah we get we get bullied by jocks so immediately you're immediately you have this other gang you know of skaters you know you you see somebody back in those days you'd see somebody with vans or airwalks and you knew oh that guy's a skater oh we have something in common and you'd go up and talk to him right on you know, i mean i was in japan I've been to Japan a few times, but I took my son when he was 20. I took him to Japan with me to help me with the show I was doing. And we're, I'm walking around Tokyo or no, I think it was Yokohama. And I see a skater coming down the hill and my son's riding toward him. And they just kind of slap five and they keep riding, oh. you know, I mean, it's so amazing to see this, this, you know, bond that, you know, skaters, you know, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what language or what race or anything, you have this bond with, with, um, I'm getting, I'm getting the, the clamped. Um, but you, you do have, you do have this bond with somebody you don't know, you know, yeah. just through skateboarding, you know? Well, uh, just a couple of more questions. You've been so nice to give your time to the, to us today. You know um, and I want to get just, uh, I'm going to go down some names here and just give me some impressions or something, you know, if you, if, if you have any good anecdotes or anything, um, and let's just start out Christian Hasoy. Wow. Uh, one of the best styles ever in skateboarding, you know, he came out of an era. I mean, he was a kid. He came out of Marina skate park, but he was probably after Alva, he was probably the next rock star of skateboarding, you know, but just, just never, I mean, so easy to shoot photos of and just has that killer kind of surf style, you know, um, just super fluid and, you know, high airs and really easy to take pictures of. Right. Those airs were just and, amazing. And, and still a good friend, you know, 
Oh yeah, I still follow him. I mean, he's still out there ripping it up. Just, mm-hmm. just amazing. Totally. Uh, yeah. How about uh, Neil Blender? Well, that's one of those art guys. Those guys <laughs> with a different, a different kind of mind. You know, doing you know art. I mean, he did. I worked with him from the beginning of Trans World, and that's when we would run a lot of cartoons in the magazine. And I mean, they were just drawing funny pictures, and we were putting them in the magazine. But yeah, he's he's still one of those super creative guys, and he just has a different he's just got a different way of thinking, you know, he's kind of like, I'm not going to say he's on the spectrum, but he's like out on the edge somewhere, you know, (laughs) and just did his own thing. And then everybody wanted to copy him. Yeah. Yeah. He was so unique, you know, and the artwork just kind of pulled into everything. And, and, you know, speaking of artists, how about Gons? Um, Another guy just inventing. I mean, he pretty much in a couple of other people, you know, just took to the streets and made up a whole new genre of skateboarding. You know, I mean, it came out of the basics of the seventies, but then they took it three dimensionally onto handrails and, and architecture, you know, and they, and they just, you know, he's from LA or, or Montebello or one of those places. And, and just, they just use their environment and thought up, you know, new ways to skate and, and then is one of the probably best skaters that who ever lived, you know, and can ride vert too. Right. So, and just, I think what he was, what he came up with was this kind of, he might've been one, he and Lance and people like that, I think fingerboarding and stuff <laughs> like that and cartooning or whatever. They go, Hey, let's try this. They don't know if they can do it, but then they try it, you know? Oh yeah. So well, yeah, but he's still he's still like that. He's creative and he's you know still they're oddballs kind of, you know. Well, how about uh how about Tommy Guerrero? Um just, well, his his music thing, you know, he's one of another one of those guys that are just, you know, great musician and uh a thinker. I mean, he he brought up San Francisco. I mean, he's probably one of the most famous skaters who ever came out of San Francisco and, you know, street skater, smooth style. Um, I met him at Del Mar. He would come down with everybody and they'd sleep either in the parking lot or in the highball games there. They had highball, this trampoline game and they'd sleep in there. And, <laughs> and so, and then I'd go up and shoot, one of my most productive shoots ever. I spent a couple of days in San Francisco and probably got eight good photos of him and his friends, you know, Jim Thibault and, and Orb and, yeah. and uh, Julian Stranger and all these other rad skaters. Fucking legends, but, man. And then I'm still friends with him. And I, when he plays down here, I go and watch him play at this local place in San Diego. Well, yeah, I've got. To, I hope he gets out to the East Coast sometime. We've been wanting to get him on this podcast because he's such mm-hmm. a, you know, it's it kind of encompasses what I was talking to you about. Just so many talented people, just displaying so many various talents, and I feel like skateboarding was really kind of a catalyst for a lot of this. Um, yeah. And uh, one True. last one on that, uh, a friend of yours and someone that I, I think you've been shooting is pretty much his whole career, and that's Tony Hawk. Yeah. Um, well, Tony, when they when they bulldozed Oasis Skate Park, he was a local there. And then his dad started bringing him up to Del Mar. And then I remember him, you know, somebody saying, oh, this kid, Tony Hawk's out there. He's uh, from San Diego. And then and then he ended up moving. His family moved to Cardiff, which is only, you know, a few miles from Del Mar, probably like three, four miles from Del Mar. And uh He just got better and better over time. He became a local there. And then he was the ruler of that pool, pretty much the keyhole. And that pool, you know, the photos did it a lot of justice because it wasn't very good. (laughs) You know, there were there were a lot of problems with it. People would come from other skate parks like the Upland guys would come down for a contest and they hated that pool. Really? And then. Yeah, and then the Del Mar guys would go to Upland, and they were afraid of it. You know, it's like just the gnarliest pool that they ever so existed. So much vert, Probably. right? How yeah, much... so much vert. Yeah, 
but uh, Del Mar was pretty easier to ride once you got used to it. But Tony, I've just been, he wrote the intro in my book and he talks about our careers kind of coinciding where, you know, I build up my photography career and then he became a skater and I was shooting photos of him and putting them in the magazine. So um, we just, you know, I've always, he's one of the best skaters who's ever lived, you know, absolutely, and done and done the most for the skate, for the sport of skateboarding and for building skate parks. And, you know, he's just really done a lot for skateboarding and, you know, there's, there were haters, you know, that they made fun of his style or whatever, but man, he's still doing it, you know, in his late fifties. And, and, uh, I mean, it's pretty incredible what he's done and he's a good businessman. And, you know, I, I was friends with his parents and, and I'm friends with his siblings and, you know, they're just, you know, they were a great family and they, they all did a lot for skateboarding. Yeah, just watching him continue to push it, like you said, and it, through through injuries and everything, yeah. it's so inspiring, you know. Um, yeah, well, the guy breaks his he breaks his femur. Oh God! And then starts skating too, you know, fast again, and then has to get reoperated on. And now he's doing things that were like, he's driven. You know, he's there's there's definitely something wrong with him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's, he just pushes himself so much. You know, he's always, he's always trying to prove something to himself. I don't think he has anything to prove, but, um, yeah, no, he's, he's an amazing skater and an amazing person. You mentioned the haters, you know, in the eighties and everything. He's one of the only examples is of, of, I saw all of those people that were talking shit about him come around. I mean, almost mm -hmm. 100%. You know, like this is undeniable. You know, and, yeah. and he's he's such a he's an important figure to to skateboarding. Yeah. Well, uh, and he brought he brought skateboarding up to the point where pros could make money too. Mm -hmm. He helped he helped with that, so he's helped everybody. And you know, people always like had Christian and him as as you know competitors, but they they were friends back then, and they're super good friends now, and. You know, there was the whole North Cal, you know, no, North NorCal and SoCal rivalry going on. And a lot of that was, you know, the skaters themselves didn't really care about all that. Yeah. You know, I think it was magazines and and maybe and maybe the industry pushing that whole deal. But that oh. made it kind of cool, too. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. You got to have rivalries. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, so with one one last thing about about Tony, like uh, you shot out there when they did that animal chin ramp, the mm -hmm. which you know when we all back in on the East Coast see this ramp, we're like God Almighty, you know. Mm -hmm. What what were your impressions of of seeing that and 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 shooting out there? Yeah. Well, I was I was so stoked because Stacy, I guess it was Stacy or George Powell, they kind of split up the whole making of that video with the two magazines thrasher and trans world and trans world. I got the chin ramp <laughs> and mofo got Hawaii and, and uh pink motel and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but I was stoked to get, you know, a chin ramp and it was only there for a week, you know, and it was no permits. Somebody from the city or showed up and go, what are you guys doing? <laughs> And they were like, oh, we're just shooting a video and it'll be down in a couple of days. And, you know, we're talking, there's like a building built out in the middle of this field. And there were these, there were these beehive looking things on the property. There were these white boxes. And the guy goes, well, these are an endangered snail that live here. And <laughs> they had built on this, you know, property. You couldn't get away with it now. You know? Oh, no, no. And then it was gone. They were done with the video and they, some of the wood went to, I think Tony for a ramp. And then, um, which ended up at trans world. A lot of the wood ended up after Tony's ramp ended up, uh, as some, like they built all these loft offices and things and walls and partitions out of, I think it was originally Tony's ramp. And some of that was, might've been chin ramps. So, um, they just re you know repurposed it for 
trans world architecture. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was great shooting that because you're like, again, you weren't like, I'm shooting this. It's for now. I was just trying to get good photos for the magazine. You know, I was just stoked on it for that. And then you're not thinking that in 2000, you know, 24 that anybody would give a shit about it. You know, <laughs> we didn't think that way back in those days. You figure, oh, I'm going to do this for, you know, a few years and then I'll go on and do landscape photography or something. You right. know, I didn't think I'd be there was no when I started, there wasn't really this uh, job called skate photographer you know, that you could make a living off of. And then I just kept doing it. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm getting paid for doing this. And then, oh, I'm teaching other people to do it too. And they're making money. And then, oh, we're having kids and buying houses. And you just, it's just so abstract, yes. you know, to think that there was no job as skate photographer. It's like now there is no, that job is magazine state photographer, really. Right, right. You know? It's well, gone. It's all you're an Instagram photographer now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, this brings me to my, you know, to my last question. You know, you are there at the ground floor of skateboarding really coming into its own. You know, you've got Ty Page and all that stuff before. Mm -hmm. But you've got it really coming into its own, and you are a documentarian of that, for better or worse. You know, however you feel about that, you have a a very tremendous legacy that is mm -hmm. incredibly unique. The position you're in. So, are you going to be releasing more of of, of your photos from the from this from that time? And and how do you see the future going as far as 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 maintaining your legacy and your art your your photos? Hmm. Well, um, you know, back then I didn't think about documenting. Now I look back at it, and un unknowingly I was documenting things, and now I look at everything as documentation. <laughs> you know, because. You know, because there's going to be somebody 20 years from now that wants to look at photos from now, you know, or from, you know, the early 2000s or um, because they grew up with it. You know, like there's some kid now they want to 20 years from now, they're going to want to see photos from that they had on their wall or on their phone or or yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. And I'm just I I look at it now that I'm more of a an archivist and a curator of those. I don't want anything to happen to them. Um, I try to make them available to the skaters, you know, uh, you know, when Christian is always working on something, you know, I'm, I'm giving him photos, say he's doing an article for a magazine or whatever. I'll give him photos. I don't really care about getting paid for it because, you know, he's Christian soy and, uh, you know, things might come off of that, you know, somebody, a company or something might see a photo and then they, maybe they want to pay me for the photo. Um, but I am like a curator and an archivist. I'm an archivist of my photos. Um, cause I don't want to, you know, I, I recognize it as a piece of history and I don't want anything bad to happen to them or, you know, say they go into, you know, it's like the end of uh, Indiana Jones, where everything gets wheeled out into the. Yeah. You know, I don't want that to happen. I want them to be uh, available, and uh, so at least the skaters can get them. You know, so yeah. you know, I've talked to my kids about it, and uh, um, I'm sure everything will be okay when I'm gone. You know, my my daughter, she's just like, Dad, don't worry about it. I got it covered. I know how important all this is, you know, right on. as a piece, a piece of history. It you is. Know, there's, there's some people you can't get their photos right now. You know, they either died and weren't, they didn't have everything collected together or, you know, they're just, you'll just never see it again. You yeah. know, and I didn't want that to happen. Well, and then as far as my own projects, I'm, 
working on another book right now. It's just starting out. It's it's related to Tony. Uh, somebody else is doing it, but it will be all my photography and and uh, and but name you know be all Tony Hawk photos and so we're working on your early stages of working on that and you know just working on a lot of different things I, I make a living off of my archive you know selling prints and I do shows I did that show in Athens Georgia which was one of the best shows that I ever had and we did a slideshow at the theater and and the book signing and I mean I'd always wanted to go to Athens, Georgia because of the music connection. And then I just got uh, November. I had a show in Madrid, Spain and did a slideshow and a book signing there. So, you know, it's just, I'm having fun. Yeah. 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 And we were so happy to have you here real quick. What were your impressions? Uh, I know that you went out to Johnny Gordon's and shot out there. Mm -hmm. What, What was your impressions of the skate scene here? just craziness <laughs> you know that was one of those things you go well they have this tiny flyer <laughs> the tiniest flyer in the world and it's like in something like in honor of grant britain's photo show in athens they have this event you know like a party and there's probably 30 people skating and probably you know 100 people there all drinking beer and and just raging pretty much and you know backyard bowl ramp and uh i mean it was amazing it was it reminded me of like the 80s and the 90s you know where you would just all these friends and locals just show up and skate and i shot photos and got a few good pictures of people i didn't even know (laughs) you know and then they had that downhill session you know in town and that was it was amazing and then jason thrasher just took care of me he and his wife beth took care of us the whole time it took my wife there i mean they were like oh it was the best like the when i hear about you know hospitality that's what you hear about you know i mean that's what we experienced when we were there well, that's right on. And, you know, Jay, yeah. they're, they're such wonderful people and, you know, so talented as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and- well, you know how I met Jason? Do you know how I met him? Ah. Uh-uh. So I was in, in the 80s. I was with Ray Underhill and I think Britt Parrott and maybe Brian Ridgeway. And we went after the Louisville contest. I think this is when we, we went to um, – Uh, Nashville and to Huntsville and in Huntsville we went to that underground park and Jason was a kid skating there and my camera broke and he gave me a ride to the camera store to get a new camera (laughs) and then so he's probably in high school I would say and then he picks up I, he says it's because of me but he picked up a camera there and became a photographer and now is this rad portrait photographer commercial photographer yeah. he ends up moving to Athens and then he and his wife open up you know the um uh Francisco gallery there yeah yeah and uh, ace ace Francisco gallery and then he asked me over a year ago, if I wanted to have a show there and I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then it all came from there and we got sponsors for it. And he rigged, you know, got the CNA thing going and the, and the bookstore and avid bookstore and all that, you know, hooked up and we got other sponsors and then, yeah, it was, it was incredible. I mean, the way it all came together, it was probably the best uh, event I've ever had, you know, well, I, I tell you, I put a we put a picture up of me and you on on Instagram when you were at Cine, and you know I interview bands and stuff. But I got more messages that night, like, "Oh my God!" You know, really? Yeah, and and mm. you know, it was it was just great to see the town, you know, open the red carpet for for you know, you're you're definitely a Athenian, you're an honorary mm-hmm. Athenian now. So you have yeah. to come back. Um, yeah no i i want to if he ever does it wants to do it again i'll do it right yeah. right but, well but i rival that that trip is up there with any trip pretty much i mean good food and 
yeah, no, I had a great time, met some great people, met some other artists there and other photographers and painters and musicians and, you know, the whole REM connection and B-52s and, you know, I was into all that. So that's, you know, it's one of those towns you want to go to and it, it's kind of a bubble in the South too. It really you know? is. I mean, yeah. that's why it's I moved like, here. <laughs> yeah you don't know you're in the south until you get outside of town <laughs> right you learn yeah. you 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 get uh, now you very quickly get into the south let me just <laughs> yeah <laughs> when you yeah. get to but no we love it here it's a, a beautiful artistic area we used mm -hmm. to drive down here and just go street skating when i was a teenager Rad. in the cool. 80s um well, well, Grant, it's such a pleasure for you uh, to talk to you today. Thank you for all your time. Is there any, what's the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you and to, act, you know, buy prints, get the book? Yeah. Um, through, you can get prints through jgrantbrittonphotos.com. That's where I have my shop and I have a gallery and a blog online. And then the books you can get through Ginkgo Press. Um, there, uh, there's other ways to get the book too. You can get signed books from uh, Grounded, which is a shop here in Encinitas, and they're online. They're called Shop Grounded, and got signed books. And then the Barnes and Noble in Encinitas, you have to call them, but they've got signed books too. I don't really sell the book myself. I didn't want to deal with all the shipping and everything, yeah. but um, or just look for me next time. You know, I'm doing a book signing someplace. You know. Well, for me, and I'm sure everybody else, thanks so much for changing our lives with your with your I'm artwork. Sure. It 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 yeah. it was a like I said, it was a view into the cool man. And well, I, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to change anyone's life. I wanted to turn people on to skate, skateboarding, and photography, and skateboard photography. You know, and that's all I really cared about. You know. Well, I mean, it's done a lot for me. I mean, it changed my life. Skateboarding changed my life. And, uh, you know, people say, when people say, hey, skateboarding saved my life, and I believe it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. Well, yeah. thank you so much for, for coming on today, and we'll talk, hopefully uh, we can talk to you again when, when you get the hot book done. Okay, great. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you. I'm, I was honored. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I'd like to thank Jay Grant Britton for being on the Ratio Podcast. I mean, it was a thrill of a lifetime for me just to talk to that cat. And I'm proud to call him a friend now. Um, I would urge you to go out and get Push, uh, the book he mentions in the interview. It is, it is really a trip down memory lane, and it will spark so many memories in your mind, so many things will be firing um and you know also go check out jason thrasher's artwork his photography it's it's amazing you can you can find him through us i would imagine somehow we'll put a link up or you can uh find his website um just google jason thrasher you know i'm i'm sure his his work will, will come up immediately and that's our show for tonight. Make sure and go see Pylon Reenactment Society and make sure and go see Tears for the Dying on the Road. And welcome to anybody who is now a listener of the Ratio Podcast. We are, we are so stoked and happy that you are here. And once again, everybody, thanks so much for letting me continue to do this. We have got a wild season planned for you. And... Um, I, I'm as excited about this as I was when I started it, if not more. So I'm, I'm, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming down the pike this, uh, this year for you. So stay switched on and we'll talk to you soon.